Um, well, we've been using the, um, the concept of resilience largely from the back, background of disaster management, um, which is the sort of the research field within which I've been using it most. But in recently, in terms of future trajectories, we've been trying to think about ways in which we can co-opt and subvert the narrative around resilience to be able to empower local communities, to be able to take ownership of some of the responses, some of the planning, and some of the preemptive frameworks that have been used by government organisations, try and actually stop it from being a purely a rhetorical policy device to actually enable support of community action in different ways. And that's one of the areas where trying to turn the, the generative metaphor of resilience into more than just another emergent rhetoric, it's actually about trying to use it as a policy solution. Um, and at the, what I've learned as well from this is that there is, from the last day or so, there are a lot more areas where it could be mobilised outside purely disaster management background, but whether or not it's productive to impose a political economy framework onto it, I'm still not entirely convinced. So we'll see how we go with some of the discussions that we have this afternoon and taking that forward. I'll jump in here because I think uh, I have some, some kind of common, uh, we share a common, uh, common set of assumptions on this. Because I think a lot of resilience research up till now uh, is based on this, this kind of blackmail of being either for or against resilience. Um, so the, the first initial trajectory was that resilience would be the uh, solution to all these uh, problems of, of uncertainty, of complexity uh, that, that characterize um, the, the kind of postmodern world. Um, out of that, a very good and very kind of critical scholarship came in um, that began to kind of unpick some of the, the assumptions embedded within resilience uh, and began uh, really kind of helpfully pointing the ways in which kind of a lot of the, the assumptions resonated with uh, neoliberalism, a lot of the gene genealogical lines uh, could, could be tied to, to neoliberalism, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but the problem is that both of these um, both these frameworks tend to assume that they know what resilience is, which, and I think all of us sitting at the table now, having done years and years of, of resilience research, are confident enough to say, we have no idea what resilience means. It's not because we haven't tried, it's because, uh, you know, there's many different types of resilience, and its meaning seems to keep proliferating uh, as it gets attached to, to different problem spaces, different actors, and so on and so forth. So I think from that recognition, that we have as a very kind of mobile, evolving, contingent definition. That then opens up a space for us to not stand on the outside and declare good and bad, but to really go and do deep uh, empirical work to tease out what are the, the specific kind of problematic aspects of it, and where are the aspects that, that have a little bit more promise, and not what does resilience mean, but what can resilience mean, and how can it be used to, to kind of uh, shake things up where necessary. And of course this is this is complicated, this is dangerous, uh, because it means no longer kind of cynically crossing our arms across our chest and saying no, but actually going in and intervening. Uh, so maybe this is a different form of critique, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that's more Deleuzean and more based on, on a kind of um, teasing out uh, conditions of possibility and, and new worlds, new values, new modes of being. And it's also interesting to think about how it works in policy circles. That there's a demand to think about resilience in terms of development, in terms of security, mm. and you can see policy institutions, the UN, uh, other agencies, trying to think about how does it work? Can I just do what I'm already doing and get funding for it, or do I have to rethink the sort of temporality, the goals of what we're doing, how we work? And so that's to me that's been really interesting, just seeing people thinking through resilience in terms of their own work as it sort of emerges into the world. As you say, I don't think it's a fixed thing that we can say resilience is this, but it certainly seems to help us reorientate and we think ways of doing policy stuff. Yeah. yeah. I like the idea that there's, uh, interventions can be mobilised in a lot of different creative ways, and a creative action can actually be a project of action research in a different way that exposes conditions of possibility. It allows us to critique governance whilst being active players in the process of creating new ways of governing. The thing I worry about, though, is that it's true that resilience is critical. It's always critical. We're always learning to do things differently. But it seems to be going in the same direction. It's a secular sort of blurring of the distinctions between different areas of policy.
policy making, peace, environment, democracy, and also sort of dissolving policy goals and aspirations. So there's much more thinking on the hoof, iterative feedback processes, and that it seems to be a sort of a dissolve. It seems to dissolve more than it actually creates, as far as I can see. So yeah. I'm not too sure how we have such a sort of optimistic view of how we can use resilience to creatively engage. Yeah, well, I think that's part of the idea that it is a, it's an unfinished project and it's an ongoing project and it will be an iterative and ongoing procedure trying to figure out what is the good and bad things about some of these solutions that we might be able to generate. But part of the joy of that and like this, part of the danger of it as well, is that to be able to mobilize it meaningfully, it requires that we take some risks. You're not saying that if we shouldn't engage, I'm saying that we can engage using it, but the way in which we do so, we don't necessarily know what the outcomes will be. Yeah. So that sounds radical when you say that when policymakers are saying <laughs> we're just doing iterative processes of feedback, we don't have any goals, yeah. it seems very really difficult to hold them to account. It yeah. seems very difficult to have traditional lines of responsibility. Yeah. Mm. So as, as critical theorists, I would worry about losing those aspects of, of taking responsibility for the policymakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, I think that's a really good point. I think it, it uh, you know it becomes more productive to think of uh, these kind of postmodern notions of resilience rather than thinking of it in, in epochal terms as if we moved away from something called modernity into this notion of postmodernity. All of a sudden, we have all these tools and concepts for governance to see how these these systems really kind of layer on top of one another. So yes, we have these postmodern notions of resilience, but uh, they're layered upon. Uh, governance structures that are still very hierarchical. Um, they're layered on top of uh, technologies of insurance um, that have been kind of performing resilience in a very kind of different way for, for decades. Um, they're, they're dependent on uh, uh, risk assessments, right, and these, these risk maps. Uh, so all these things are still used, but they, they get reconfigured, right? They become supportive elements for, for a kind of larger agenda. Uh, and so I think we need to be hesitant of, of like I said, uh, identifying an epochal shift from one to the other, and rather see how this kind of new regime of governance recodes uh, and reassembles all these kind of older technologies. Yeah, there's not a utopian solution to these problems. It's not that we're, we're not going to eradicate risk. We're not going to eradicate vulnerability. No matter what system you adopt, there will always be weaknesses in it and vulnerabilities that get exposed by events as they occur. So you know, the, it's not an it's not an end game. It's a means to change the game. And I like I like the focus on continuities, but I think there's sometimes a danger of not seeing how quickly things have been moving. You know, even like disaster risk. Yeah. Disasters were external things that happened to us that we could prepare for. It. And increasingly it seems that you know we are part of the process that we can't separate ourselves from disasters. But yeah. we learn about ourselves through things that previously were arbitrary or acts of nature or something. So we're continually expanding our relational engagements, and, and in doing that, we're flattening out the world. It's very difficult to think politically to take responsibility. So I think part of that we'll, we will be perpetually learning from whatever happens, and that's part of being resilient. I guess is that there is an ongoing learning, but the learning is normally about how to be more open and relational to the world rather than a traditional way of having knowledge to, to act as I think that's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is it. We won't stop. We'll just keep going.